Chapter 14. The room wasn't very large, and the members of the Brotherhood filled it to capacity. Each pressed close upon the other for a better look at the minions of the Dark One. Real infidels were rarely available for purging, and none among the Brotherhood wanted to miss the infrequent, interesting ceremonies. Light from lamps and lanterns surrounded, er, surrounding the curved circular room threw dancing shadows against the dome. High braziers were filled with burning oil and wood. The stars shone brightly through the round skylight. Three bronze basins with sloping bottoms flashed green gold on the paved floor. Each contained a single body with head high, set higher than feet. Feet. Hellspot Duquesne was the tallest of the three, and his head did not reach the top of the basin. Like the others, he was tightly bound with his hands fixed to his sides. Milliken Williams occupied the basin to his right, with Colette to his left. She'd managed to break the bonds on her feet early and leave a number of very sore brothers in her wake, but to no avail. The brothers had slowly been filling the basins with water, a bucket at a time, brought in from the melting room. Since the room was not heated, the cold night air of Tranquiti was gradually freezing each successive douse of water. A dose of water. The captives were now encased up to the shoulders in a jacket of diamond clear ice. Colette continued to rain verbal destruction on the gathering in several languages, none of which the brothers understood. A small chorus of saying, of saying continued to moan the same unmelodic drone they'd sung since the water pouring had begun. Only their superb survival suits had kept the captives from serious frostbite thus far, and these wouldn't help when the ice rose over their heads. Colette looked from her father, motionless in both ice and trance, and then up at the watching brothers. We've done nothing to you. Why are you doing this to th this thing? The kindly prior stared amusedly down on her. <laughs> that a servant of the Dark One should have the audacity to ask for mercy. Listen, she sighed tiredly, giving a little shiver. The cold was beginning to exceed her suit's capacity to withstand it. We don't even know what your darn Dark One is. If you're moronic enough to believe that we're the disciples of some local devil of yours, I feel sorry for you. No, she, it is I who must be sorry for you, replied the prior righteously. Tis known to all that the place where the earth's blood burns is the home of the Dark One himself. From whatever homeland people come, all know that. T'was fortunate that you inadvertently revealed your destination to us so that we could take proper steps. We are not ignorant peasants here. He looked skyward into the night, and as you shall partake of the cold that has held our beloved home lo, these many centuries, so shall the time of the final warming be brought closer. He brought back, he looked back at her. That is our end and goal. Look here, Williams was feeling the cold more than any of them, and now he was having trouble speaking. If we're minions of this dark one or not, freezing us isn't going to heat your world. Tis written in the great old books that for every servant of the dark one who has returned to the primeval cold, our world shall grow a little warmer, a little softer, a little greener. To this end is the brotherhood pledged. Listen, continued the schoolmaster desperately. Trankiki might be made warm and green again. My people know a process called terraforming that could conceivably melt this ice and raise the planetary temperature. But you couldn't adapt it you couldn't adapt if it were to happen in your lifetime. Besides, you'd all drown. You lie most intriguingly, evil one, but think not to deceive us. Two of the brothers approached. They carried a large bronze kettle between them. Carefully they distributed its load of water between the three basins. Colette tried to pull herself higher as they poured the ice water into hers, but it brought the water level up to her neck. The pair left for the melting room for another load. Almost immediately, a crust began to form on top of the water. Another few trips and the ice would be over her head, or maybe the insulation on her suit would give out before then. We come openly as guests and you receive us with murder, she said, a little frightened now. Any kind of reasonable logical argument she could fend aside and handle, but, but religious fanatics? We needed your help. We intended to help you, soothed the prior. He turned to the shifting, watching of mob. Brothers, these poor degenerate minds cry out to us for salvation. Let us pray for them, that their souls may meet in the next plane of existence, uncontaminated by illogic and unreason. Let it be so, hummed the assembled brotherhood. They joined the uninspired choir in its steady, dissonant drone, the noise broken only by Colette's hysterical sobbing. There was a sudden violent crack from above. A deep voice moaned in terrifying, sepulchral 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 tones let it be known that the dark one protects his own rapidly it added in terranglo cover your eyes immediately all the trannish eyes in the room shot upward while the trio of imprisoned humans bent their heads and squeezed their eyes shut explosion bodies flying those left standing made a concerted panic dash for the exit trampling some of the wounded in an unbrotherly haste to escape 
Above the weird box boomed, I am the power and the glory of darkness, and all who stand against me shall be slain. There was another explosion, and more of the Brotherhood fell. A lesser crash sounded from above. It was followed by brilliantine tinkling as the skylight was shattered. A cable ladder snaked into the room. Before the bottom had unrolled, Skua September was already halfway down its swaying length. Ethan Hunter and several soldiers followed. The big man went immediately to the single doorway. He needed Hunter's help to clear away the bodies. Thank deity for small favors, he breathed. It bolts from the inside. Hunter threw the latch. Tis not strong, Sir Skua. It will not stand against a determined rush. Ethan and the soldiers all had torches strapped to their right waists. They were, inten they were intended to provide light if the brothers blew out the lamps. Now they were put to a different use. A quick thrust into a hanging lantern, and they were lit. Then they began the slow, dangerous work of trying to melt the trapped prisoners free. Ethan was working on one side of the copper basin that held Colette. Hurry, please, she pleaded. I, I can't feel my legs anymore. How much time, September asked Hunter. One cannot say, the knight stared at the bolted door. These are not soldiers and do not react as such. Yet it will soon occur to the last of the escapees that we are far from supernatural in shape or form, and some might have recognized us. It took four of them to lift each metal coffin. Two tilted the heavy container upward. One at a time, the three prisoners slid free, each still encased in a block of ice. Now the melting could proceed at a decent pace. "'Tis a difficult decision for them,' Hunter continued. "'If we are truly servitors of the Dark One, as our ability to throw thunder and lightning might suggest, then I would not expect them to attack again at all. But they might consider us to be only mortal servants of the Dark One, deluded mortals, in which case, shove the Dark One. How much time have we got?' There was a thump as someone tried the door, then a rattling of the latch. This was quickly followed by a series of heavy bumps, then silence. "'Well, that answers that,' the big man growled. He turned back to the center of the room. The melting was nearing completion, and Williams, Colette, and the motionless senior, senior Duquesne were almost free. "'You know,' said Ethan, conversationally, as he melted away the last of the clinging ice from her ankles, "'you'd look absolutely awesome in a martini.' "'I could use one about that size right now,' she replied tightly. "'Thank the devices for these suits.' He started to rub her legs, and she didn't protest. "'I'm okay,' she said finally. "'Help the teacher.' Ethan looked over at the senior Duquesne, who lay, quite, who lay still and quiet on the stone floor. "'Your father? Is he... Watch. She bent over him, and her, Ethan heard her whisper in his ear, free credit. A hand twitched, then a leg, stillness, and then the old man sat up, blinking and looking up at his daughter. She put a big arm under his left and helped him to his feet. Well, my dear, are we safe or are we dead? It's still a moot point, father, but we incline to the former. He sighed. Ah, well, pity. Click. I was so wondering what kind of flowers they have in the next world. Only flower souls. I've told you that, father. Come on now, move around a little. That's it. At Ethan's slack-jawed stare, she replied, automatic protective trance. He goes into it whenever his system is overloaded. This isn't the first time it's saved his life. There was a loud crash, and the door shook violently. We've overstayed our welcome, suggested Ethan. September stood facing the door, watching it silently. He held a small, tightly bound package of old leather, leather in one hand. It had a short, stubby fuse projecting from it, and he nonchalantly tossed it from one palm to the other, back and forth, back and forth. Let's step lively there, folks. What? There was another crash, and the door bolts inward alarmingly. Williams was being helped through the shattered skylight. Hellspont Duquesne was halfway up the ladder, and Ethan waited while, with Colette at the bottom. Let's go, he said finally. She looked uncertainly at the swaying ladder. I, I don't know. I'm not built for this kind of exercise. Would you rather be in that martini? Come on, go. I'll help you. She started up. He put a hand under her enormous rear. It felt like a cake of sherbet and tried to give her weight a boost upwards. Then he mounted the ladder close behind. If she fell, he didn't know what he, do, he could do. While she climbed and grunted, he climbed and prayed. Hunter was right behind him. September walked to the bottom of the ladder. The crackle of splintering wood filled the room, and the door exploded inward. A mob of howling robed scholars pulled up and piled up, or piled into the entrance. They pulled up short at the side of September, standing calmly under the ladder. A few carried knives this time, probably appropriated from the monastery kitchens. The brothers were fast losing their intellectual detachment. September reached out and touched the fuse to a nearby lamp. He looked at it for a moment, then gently tossed it. It landed at the feet of the unmoving brothers. September continued to watch it with interest. The fuse shrank. Then, in one motion, he turned, leaped, and was halfway up the ladder before someone in the mob unfroze and threw the first club. Ethan was peering anxiously down through the broken glass. He extended a desperate hand and Hunter another. Together, they all yanked hard, and Ethan fell backwards. September came out of the opening, tumbled onto the roof, and was followed by a geyser of dust and pulverized stone. Quite a banger, he murmured, feeling his side where a thrown staff had grazed him. Glad I saved that one for last. 
For the second time that night, Ethan found himself running blindly over rooftops, dodging pillars and buttresses, dropping from level to level toward the stairway. Apparently, the brothers were too disorganized or demoralized to offer ready pursuit. Or maybe that last bomb had eliminated the sanctimonious prior and several of his deputies. At any rate, they met no opposition in their hectic scramble downwards. They reached the last roof above the stairway without being challenged. To their left, a long black streak extended back into the monastery, a charred wound, the results of Hunter's covering blaze set earlier that night. A large band of brothers stood in front of the burnt entrance, armed with the usual clubs and staves. They were expecting an attack from the front. Clearly, no one had brought them the word about the return of the Dark One's other servants. Not very military. Hunter's soldiers surprised them completely. There was no pursuit as they started their second dash down the stairway. So much for rule by logic, reason and logic, September grunted. He was breathing heavily. The run down from the monastery had finally tired even him. They na but now they were safe on board the slander scree, and there weren't enough brothers in the world to get them off it again. The big man was staring up at the monastery buildings, faint ghosts against the black crags. Well, they performed well enough within their own tight little precepts. Ethan countered. Behind him, Tahoding was sending the crew aloft, yelling dire threats at imagined slackers. The slander tree began to move out of the harbor. Astern, a quartet of soldiers were ungently dumping the brothers who'd taken the raft earlier. It was more humane than similar actions that had been performed on Terra years ago, or ages ago, for there was no water for the captives to drown in. On the other hand, the ice wasn't especially soft. The wind blew, and the sound of the slander tree enslaved it cutting west, then south, to take advantage of the slightest counter-breeze. Dehoding didn't miss many. A week later, they saw the first smoke. It blew steadily to the east, black and sooty, and well up in the atmosphere. From there, Dehoding was able to ignore the compass and follow the black line. They made even better time. It was another two days before they had their first glimpse of the place where the Earth's blood burns, and another two before the, mass, before the base of the giant volcano came into view. Mottled brown and black, splashed higher up with ice and snow, 14 kilometers of vertical hell surrounded, uh, shrouded in polar rock and ice. It was magnificent, awesome, and a little bit frightening. Well, no hallucinations so far, Ethan mused. How, Colette snapped back, could you tell the difference? William's voice sounded from behind them. I'd very much like to land. Ethan turned. Ear Misatch was there, too. Really, Milliken, in light of the past weeks, don't you think... A huge paw came down easily on his shoulder. We did leave without properly fixing the bow sprite, friend Ethan, said Hunter. Nor did the crew receive their promised chance for a rest on shore. You're not afraid of the spirits and goblins, or you're not afraid the spirits and goblins will object? The knight didn't smile. He gazed over the ice at the sky rubbing cone. As a cub, I might have been. As a younger man, I'd have been uncertain. But the wizards have explained to me what it really is, a thing neither supernatural nor inherently inimical, inimical and I am not afraid. They followed the jagged shore southward, searching for a place to put in. Hundreds of meters of broken, tortured rock fell in undisciplined cataracts into the, onto the clear ice, but nowhere did it level off. Just as they rounded the southern tip of the island mountain, hitting into the wind again, the plutonic crust abruptly gave way to a smooth, level stone beach. Ropey lines of pahoho, pahoho marched gently into this frozen sea, they tied up half into the wind, still protected by the sheltering bulk of the volcano. Ice anchors were used this time, set with care and precision under Tahoding's experienced watch. Once again, the repair crew set about their tasks, for the last time, one hoped. Considering what they'd gone through the past weeks, though, they were, there were none who blamed the craftsmen for an occasional over-the-shoulder glance. You couldn't be too sure that the ground would not still deliver up yet another fiendish surprise, eh? So the carpenters and sail weavers worked a little slower, a little more observantly. Roiling blackness, distant night stars of plasmoid terror, vast spaces unmeasurable, false concepts of life and death. The living dark came, a loathsomeness of long licorice tent tentacles and soul-draining fangs. It groped for him in the emptiness, reaching, twisting. He ran faster and faster on a sea of gurgling tar, an oily sky overhead. The ocean grabbed and tugged at him. Down he looked and saw in horror that it wasn't a sea at all. He was running on the back of an amorphous amoeba that humped and shook and laughed. He tried to jump, but now fat, greasy pseudopods held him firm. All about the nightmare, shapes flowed up and around. In the middle of each, the faces of things not human chuckled and puckered at him. Black fronds clutched high, tighter, enveloping, suffocating. 
He tried to scream, and one of the inky ropes dove down his throat, choking him. They crawled over his eyes, under his ears, into his nostrils. Celia brushed and tickled obscenely. He couldn't breathe. He coughed, gagged. The thing in his throat was curling into his belly, swelling, filling him with gravid blackness. The interior of the cabin was dark, too. But it was a comforting, familiar, prosaic dark, not sticky, not malevolent, not full of nightmare shapes. Despite the cold, he was sweating profusely and heaving like he'd just finished marathon. <sighs> Shaking, he reached for the lamp, then caught himself. His hand paused in midair, drew away slowly. No, no, it was a bad dream. Nothing more. Happens to everyone. He put both hands on the bed, palms flat against the blankets and furs, and lay down slowly, staring at the bare outline of the ceiling. With a conscious effort, he closed his eyes and breathed out long and low. Then he hunched slowly on his side and fluffed the blanket under his head. His last thought before falling asleep was that he hadn't had a nightmare since childhood. He wondered about it for a second. Morning light bit like a mosquito. The volcano did not shine or sparkle in the false alpine glow. If anything, the black volcanic rock absorbed the light. Only at upper elevations did ice and snow work to do eye-pleasing things with the rich light. A dark, brooding, brooding ziggurat, the mountain gave no hint of the burning core that steamed in its depths. Even the cloud-scudding black smoke was a, coal, was a cold coal. There was nothing so palpable as an air of menace about this mountain, but neither was it pleasant to be near. It needed companion mountains, a sibling range around its base, before mere humans could relate to it. Alone, it was as impersonal and alien as a lost moon. Ethan leaned on the, the rail and gazed at the ropey beach. He'd almost have preferred to stay on board, but there was always the thin chance that something interesting might turn up. He only stumbled once as they made their way across the ice and onto the rock. Small cause for pride. On the frozen lava, the humans had an advantage over their tran companions. The natives had to pick their way carefully on unclad feet over the nastier sections of Aa -A and Scoria. The two wizards could have gone by themselves. However, someone had to go along to tell the two learned beings that it was time to return to the slander screen. Left to themselves, they would wander about the island till dark, get lost, and then there'd be a broken leg or twisted ankle, and the hard work of carrying them back to the ship in the dark. The slopes of the gigantic cone seemed to soar up and up into the op opalescent blue until they merged at the artist's vanishing point. You could tell there was a top only because of the black smoke that issued therefrom, somewhere in the clouds. Well, they could spend the morning picking around at the rocks at the shelter of the east slope, acquire a few specimens, and return to the ship. The rocks ought to keep Williams and Irmisach occupied and out of trouble until they reached Arsudan. Ethan didn't expect any surprises. Even Williams had enough sense to forego suggesting an ascent. But he hadn't, hadn't counted on the cave. It was well concealed by rock and low brush as they walked past the entrance. It looks no different from any other section of immolated stone. Only the early morning light shining straight into it gave any hint shining straight into it gave any hint that it might be larger than the thousands of similar pockets which dotted the lava. He bent and peered inside. It was large enough for a train to walk upright in, so he called the others over. Fascinating, said the schoolmaster, staring inside. Before anyone could stop him, the teacher had stepped carefully over a chunk of a uh -uh and was standing on the smooth floor of the cave. Get out of there, Milliken, said September. The whole business could come down on you any second. Pish tosh, this is a structure built by nature. Not mere man, Mr. September. Once a tube like this has been formed, it will remain so until a violent upheaval cracks the set rock. My dear ear, me, ear Misach, you must see this. What is it? The Tran Wizard had knelt slowly and was staring into the hole now. Williams's voice floated back from some ways in. The walls of the tube are lined with a luminescent lichen or fungi of some sort. I can see quite clearly, even though I am well away from the entrance. There was a pause. It appears to extend into the mountain for some distance. Then by all means, replied Irmisach, scrambling over the lip of the hole, we must explore further. Hunter looked resignedly at September. I'd as soon wait here, Sir Skua, but those two would surely lose themselves at the first purring of, way of passageways. The big man dug into a coat pocket and pulled out one of the small compasses from the survival supplies. I expect you're right, he agreed. Might as well go myself. Hunter hopped down into the tunnel, followed closely by Budger and Soxus. September went next, turned, and looked back at Ethan. Coming, young feller, me lad? He hesitated. The tunnel did not look especially inviting. But they could be watched, watching from the ship. Colette had already confessed a fear of the dark. It was the only thing that seemed to face her. Naturally, he had to go in. 
It was a good thing he had no time to work on the logic of his thinking, or he wouldn't have been terribly happy with the resultant picture. They walked at a leisurely pace, moving deeper and deeper into the mountain. The walls, ceiling, and floor had been scoured almost slippery smooth. There were places where the ceiling rose to two and three times the height of a tram, and here and there there were vents of green clay. Green clay in volcanic vents. Now, where had he seen that before? He puzzled over it. The glowing plant life grew mo no more luxuriant as they moved down the tunnel, but it didn't grow dimmer either, and it supplied enough light to show occasional boulders and rocks that had fallen from the roof. Green clay in volcanic vents? The number was small, Ethan noted gratefully. He moved ahead to listen to the schoolmaster. Lava has gone through this passage fairly recently, Williams explained, which accounts for the smooth sides. Now that's a comforting thought, grinned Ethan. He thought of the millions of tons of hot magma beneath their feet, whose outlet had once been the tube in which they now trod. After an hour's hike, Hunter finally declared a halt. The wizards gave no sign of tiring, and the tunnel no signs of ending. Scientific exploration is all very well and good, the knight said, crouching against the cold gray wall, but we've brought no provisions with us. I do not believe further exploration of this hole, which could run clear through the mountain, is worth missing the midday meal. This opinion was seconded immediately by September, Ethan, and both squires. Outvoted, the two scholars capitulated gracefully. I, too, confess to being somewhat wearied and hungered, admitted Irmisach and we seem to have learned all that we might, yet it would be interesting to know if this tube opens near the central vent itself. I'm cold, September quipped, but not that cold. He sat down across from Hunter and began flipping pedals against the far wall. Ethan took a few steps forward and prepared to rest also. He squinted hard down the tunnel. Hey, it does seem to get a little brighter ahead. Your eyes are tired from straining in this light, lad. The big man glanced down the tunnel without getting up. Looks the same to me. No, really, it does, Ethan continued. He took another couple of steps forward. It does. He started to walk down the tunnel. Don't go too far, September warned him. Don't go out of voice range. I don't want you making a wrong turn into some endless maze. If you do, I'm not coming after you, but... Don't worry, Skua, I'm not going to go far. The tunnel made a sharp turn to the right, just ahead. That would be far enough. He turned and stepped into the chamber. It was larger than the tunnel, perhaps three or four times as wide as the passageway, and equally as high. There were no more phosphorescent plants here than behind them, but the light was blinding. Blinding, dazzling, overpowering, and green. Now he remembered where he read of green clay and volcanic vents. Osmodine was mined in only two places in the known universe. One was on a teeny island in the middle of a lake on the Thranks world of Drax IV. Drax IV was a hell world, a steaming, sweltering, moldy ball of corruption that would drive a man insane if the Popioni or Turabasi Delphius didn't get him first. The Thranks could survive the heat and humidity, but the local flora and fauna made no species distinctions when it came to dinner. But there was Osmidine Osmi there, so they stayed. The other load had been found on Mantis, one of the first worlds settled by humanity after the discoverer of the KK Drive. It had been discovered not by a lonely prospector, nor by mining combine, nor by official survey. A driller pushing a new subway tunnel through the heart of downtown Locust had come on the first deposits. Now there was an ugly, dark, smoky hole in the middle of the planet's capital city, but the inhabitants didn't mind. Or didn't mind. It made them rich. On the scale of comparative hardness for minerals, diamond is the hardest at 10. Or rather, it was until Osmodine was found to have a hardness rating of about 14. And the crystals of the raw material were of a deep green, shading to violet, that made the finest emeralds look like soapstone. Osmodine was only found in igneous rocks, in vents of greenish clay. Ethan stumbled forward, his eyes adjusting to the light thrown back at him from an endless hull of green hexagonal crystal. Osmodine hung from the ceiling like stalactites. It grew outward from the walls like decorative swords, filling the floor with spikes and crushed crystals from the ceiling. He'd once seen a picture of the Green Nova. The Green Nova was a piece of pure osmodine from the Drax IV mine. It was as big as a man's fist and had taken 13 months to cut and facet by the finest stone cutter on Terra using lasers and osmodine cutting tools. It had no price. He stumbled, wincing at the pain in his toe. He tripped over a chunk of clear osmodine the size of a basketball. This wasn't wealth. There was no way, no means of comparing this to normal human pursuits. The ownership of whole worlds lay in this tunnel, power to alter the structure of governments, even enough to shake the church itself. Hey, young fella, came September's voice. It's time to... Dimly, Ethan recognized the voice of September and the others behind him, but he didn't turn. 
He knew what they looked like. Something shook underfoot. He felt it, ignored it. My dear ear, ear Mesatch, this is wonderful, Williams whispered. Such symmetry of form, such amazing variety. He frowned. Was that a tremor? Yahoo! bellowed September. He grabbed Ethan and danced in a circle while Ethan hung on for dear life, his feet centimeters off the floor. Gods and devils and broken hearts and broken names and all the lost promises down the trail of time. He stopped, let Ethan down. Ethan felt himself to make sure no bones were broken. He grinned up at the other. My sentiments exactly. September picked up a flawless piece of crystal as big as his thumb. He landed on his rump. The earth shook. Shards of priceless gemstone, any one worth a king's life, pelted Ethan's unprotected face. When the shaking stopped, he felt himself gingerly. He'd received some very expensive scratches. Below, a steady rumbling had begun. There were demons afoot in the mountain. Williams was backing toward the tunnel proper, a little of his scientific detachment gone. He watched the walls warily. I, I do believe it would be best if we returned to the ship. I think something may happen. His words penetrated the green haze surrounding Ethan. He was dimly aware that September was shaking him. Better do what he says, young feller. We can come back tomorrow. Maybe. Time to leave. Leave? Ethan stuttered. Return? He looked up at the big man, blinked. Leave this? No. Absolutely no. No, young feller, began September. No, I won't. I found it. Darn it. I'm staying. You go. September chuckled. All right, lad. Have it your way. He turned and walked past Ethan and clipped him neatly on the jaw as he passed. He knelt, scooped up the slumping body, and threw it over his shoulder. Let's go! He took a last glance over his shoulder, muttered even, muttered so low no one could hear him, Shanna, forgive me, and started out of the tunnel. The run back to the raft turned with, into a nightmare with groanings and heavings and cyclopean creakings alternating with distant detonations. One was powerful enough to throw them off their feet. It bloodied September's nose. He uttered a few choice curses, hefted Ethan higher on his shoulder, and continued forward at a jog. If anything, their emergence from the cavern into clean daylight inspired them to move faster. They were met at the shoreline by Balavir and a party from the ship. I'll be thanked, said the old general, clasping Hunter by the shoulders. We thought the mountain had got you. Then, then he noticed the scrapes and bruises in Ethan's unmoving form. What did happen in there? I shall tell you later, honored general, replied Hunter, if I still believe in it myself then. There was an awesome roar behind them, and they were nearly thrown again. But if that interesting talk is to take place, we must depart this accursed island now, quickly. They hurried to the ice. Two of the soldiers carried Ethan between them. They moved much faster on the ice than September could have. Put your men aloft, Captain, Hunter bellowed as they boarded the raft, but it wasn't needed. Tahoding had heard the explosions and was moving over the deck like a frightened canith, swearing tearfully that though he lived a thousand years, he'd never seen this befouled ship fully repaired. The ice anchors were brought in. Wind caught the sails, and the slanted tree moved. Drawn by the noise, the Duquesnes emerged on deck. Colette looked at the volcano and turned to question September. Then she saw Ethan's unconscious form. What happened to him? She asked casually, a little too casually, September thought. He squinted down at her as another explosion, they were growing more frequent, drowned out all possibility of communication. When it had died slightly, he shouted, he uh, bumped his head coming out of the tunnel. He shoved the limp form at her. Why don't you take care of him? Colette backed away a step. Me? I'm not a darn nurse. Let Williams or Ear Mesatch look after him. Oh, just watch him for a minute, hey? She considered, chewing her lower lip. Oh, all right, give him here. September bent and passed the dead weight to Colette. She handled it easily and sat down next to the mast with him, studying his face. September grunted appreciatively. They'd rounded the last spur of black earth and were leaving the volcano astern. The smoke now billowed from the core, or billowing form from the core, was tinged with crimson and seemed to have grown greatly in volume. There was a tremendous, ear-shattering explosion, coupled with a moaning, ripping sound. The slider tree was lifted off the ice and slammed down a few dozen meters on them. A few spars cracked. Somehow, the runners held. Tran were picking themselves up off the deck, some of them very slowly. One had been thrown from the rigging and was now a grotesque tangle of arms and legs near one hatch. Darn it, sputtered September, shaking the wrist he'd fallen on as he, pull, as he pulled himself off the planking. Ethan had come around just in time to get thrown into Colette. He bounced off. Green clay, he mumbled, then looked confused. There was something about green clay, but I've forgotten. What happened to me? You hit your head coming out of the tunnel, supplied Colette. She gently but firmly moved him off her legs, and I don't know anything about any green clay. Ethan rubbed his jaw. Funny place to fall on, and thought hard. He looked up at her, and she was staring down at him strangely. Oh, well, couldn't have been very important, he said. How would you like to be rich beyond your wildest dreams, huh? Marry me. I beg your pardon, Mr. Kane. Under the circumstances, you may call me Colette. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
He must still be dazed. I didn't even think you liked me, let alone loved me. Those startling green, green eyes stared down at him. Who said anything about love? I'm asking you to marry me. You're reasonably attractive, reasonably intelligent, and kinder than most. The only people who ask me to marry them are money hunters. I can read the contempt in their eyes. There's no contempt in yours. A little pity, but I'm used to that. Well, Ethan thought, this is too fast and I'm still dazed. Let me, let me think it over. What would your father say? She gave him a twisted smile. Father? Father's been intermittently insane for the past four years. She stood up and stared down at him with it from a great height. Who do you think's been running Duquesne Enterprises for the last four years, Ethan Fortune? Look to the mountain, yelled a voice. Those who could stagger to the rail. A kilometer or so up the side of the volcano, a huge fissure, dozens of meters wide, had cleft the mountainside like an axe blow. A broad river of fiery red and yellow spilled from the gaping fissure, overflowing the edges of the break. The amber stream gained the ice. Immediately, a jet of superheated steam roared skywards, obscuring much of the peak from view. Quite a sight, said September apprehensively, or appreciatively. There was a loud yelp behind him. Williams was absolutely terrified. He was flailing and gesturing as though he'd lost control of his arms. Easy, schoolmaster. What's the matter? Spirits? We've got to put on more sail, he piped frantically. Tell the crew to blow into them if they must. We've got to, to get away from here. Why? September glanced behind them. We've got a little wind with us now. At this rate, we'll be out of sight of the island before dark. Not, not good enough, he panted out of breath, well, or panted the out of breath, Williams. Now, look, surely we're in no danger from the lava. I'm no geologist, but not the lava, not the lava, Williams was pleading. Tahoe had walked over and was now an interested listener. So was Hunter. You don't understand. The lava will melt the ice. And that fissure may have cracked the whole island. If the cold water beneath the ice reaches the core, the pressure, incalculable, he subsided out of breath. What does the small wizard mean? asked Hunter uncertainly. September rubbed the full crop of whiskers that now coated that jutting chin under his face shield. He says the mountain's going to blow up, I think. Blow up? Tehoding's fat face was comical. His anxiety was not. Blow up, he repeated stupidly. Then he whirled and began rattling off hysterical orders and commands. The deck of the slander screen became a madhouse. The crew strove to mount every square centimeter of sail left in the lockers. They were even stringing it from rigging to hatch covers. Green picapina sailcloth went up everywhere until the slander screen resembled a moving island. Nothing happened all the rest of that day nor all night. They were still running rapidly to the southwest the next morning when it happened. The volcano was far astern and long out of sight, but they heard the rumble. There was a crackling. The whole sky northeast of them lit up in a titanic eruption of fire and flaming gases. Lightning smashed every section of unbruised sky. A pillar of red-black smoke and ash, sown with lightning, billowed into the stratosphere. This time, it was September who grabbed the megaphone and roared for everyone to hug the deck. A second later, he was imitating a termite. Nothing happened. The eruptions continued. An ominous lowing breeze swept over the ship, challenging the west wind. Then, the full force of, it, of displaced air struck them as the giant volcano began to tear itself to pieces. The maelstrom that came down on the raft made the rifts seem like a spring zephyr. The slander screen exploded forward across the ice, but most of the super tough sails held, most of the rigging held, and the lashings on the great wheel held. The Borean monster fell to a simple cyclone. September crawled to the rail and raised his head into that skin-tearing gale. Then he rose to his full height, somehow keeping his balance in the gale. Son of a gun, he yelled, howled, what a ride. Then his feet were blown out from under him, and he had to wrap his arms around a shroud to keep from being swept off the deck. Pity the lad couldn't see this, he thought, or mayhap better he doesn't. The Osmodine melted or pulverized to green dust, perhaps. Immortality was short. He looked across the planking. Colette was using her bulk to shield Ethan from some of the wind. On the other hand, he reflected, smiling, mining his work. A soft touch of a friend now, that was much more civilized. The slander screen shot southward at close to 300 kilometers an hour. The prop jet hummed smoothly on the two-man ice skimmer as it curved in its daily patrol out from the Humanx settlement of Brass Monkey and headed up the frozen fjord. The two men inside had grown accustomed to the ice-locked world and its gruff, somber native populace, but they were completely unprepared for the gigantic raft, dozens of sails billowing, which rounded the entrance to the fjord and shot past them before they could waken to challenge it. Mother, did you see that? exclaimed the pilot. How could I miss it, Marcel? replied his co-pilot, seeing how it practically ran us down. He was doing things to dashboard controls. Take over your stick before we piled into a cliffside, will you? Abashed, Marcel did so. 
Thought I'd seen every size and shape of ice craft this backwater had to offer, he mumbled. Moving like the proverbial bat out of hell, the co-founder agreed him admirably. Somebody did a heck of a job on that baby. They swung the teeny skimmer around. The prop groaned at the strain. You'd better get on the comm, tell docking and receiving to expect that thing, or someone's liable to have a fit and take a shot at it. I want to meet the natives who built that. Marcel goosed the engine to a high wind. I'll have to call. For sure, we're not going to overhaul it. He leaned to hit the comm switch and chuckled. You know, it's funny, this glare and all, but uh, that thing went by so fast I thought I saw a set of broads underwear flying astern in place of the usual native banner. Biggest pair I ever saw. Ain't that a kick? He hit another button and the screen over the angled when the screen began to brighten. Ah, you're batty. Sure, all in the mind, the pilot agreed. The co-pilot looked thoughtful. Then it's all in mind too, because I could swear I saw the same thing. The, the glance they ex exchanged was profound.